This is my pomegranate that I bought from Alan Yu. I'm talking to in this video. He's currently based out of Austin. He's a ceramic artist and landscape architect. And we have some really great conversation about um, pomegranates and other fruit and cross-cultural and specific cultural symbolism of those things. Um, and working with clay and how that sort of is like a micro version of working with the earth, which I just absolutely loved that whole connection. Um, there's also some just really general conversation that I think is valuable and applicable to every artist out there. And, um, even people in other fields, honestly, some of it, um, just talking about like, well, that plague of imposter syndrome that we all sort of fall victim to at points in our lives, uh, the beginner's mind and voice and like finding, finding your own, um, voice in what you are, um, working with and expressing in the world. And then some, I think some really good conversation around, um, value, like the value of the work that artists are creating and putting into the world. And how does that translate into financial value? Um, which I know is always a big sticky conversation. Um, but I think there's some good stuff in here. And, um, apart from all that, I really barely knew Alan. I just had found him on Instagram and fell in love with his work. And I have a thing for pomegranates, which I will explain and, um, bought this and we had a brief conversation and that's really it. And so like with some of the other people in this project, um, it's, it's just was a real pleasure to actually get to know him a little bit better. And I hope that you guys enjoy it. Um, before we get started, um, this is a pretty new project and any help that can be provided getting some traction going by subscribing to the channel and liking the video that helps with the algorithm and then um, sharing this video with your communities goes a really long way. So um, whatever you're feeling, it's going to be very appreciated. And um, at the very end of this conversation, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you like a little bone. There's a little bit of a bonus conversation at the very end. So don't run off right as we're saying bye. Here we go. So I think the most obvious place to start is um, that we need to mutually sing the praises of Eastside Pot Shop because Without that place, we wouldn't be talking. And um, I feel like they've just like made themselves such a like a, a wonderful resource in the Austin community, and actually has like contributed contributed to building community as well. How long have you been working with them? So yeah, uh, I started 2019. Uh, so I actually started right after I moved down here. I I, I was in Dallas uh, before that. I uh, moved down summer of 2019. And basically two weeks later, I joined the pot shop. Uh, yeah. So part of my Austin experience is really tied to Eastside Pot Shop. The whole time I've been here, I've been going to the pottery studio um, there. Um, but I don't, I don't think we overlapped, unfortunately. I think you were already gone by the time I started. Yeah, I started, um, I guess it was 2018 when they, when they first opened. Yeah, unfortunately, like right when you were starting was kind of right when I was pulling up my roots in Austin and um, sort of in limbo for a while. And then I've been, I've been at my parents' house in San Antonio for a lot longer than I anticipated but um I miss I miss it I I wanted to take classes there again and just like work with clay and you know like the quality 
of work that's coming out of there from people who are you know there's like a mix of people who are total beginners and people who have training you know in pottery and but it's just like everything is is really fantastic that I'm seeing coming out of there and um I think it's a real testament to Scott and Rebecca and all of the the people who are teaching there um and then just you know my experience of it was that it, it was a very communal thing so even like students were helping other students and you know uh how was your how do you feel about um like the way that community has worked for you right uh again i think my experience were very uh one-dimensional in a way because i have not had any prior pottery experience before I went into the Eastside Pot Shop. So a little bit of background about me. I am a professional, uh, I'm still practicing uh, landscape architecture. So I'm a, a licensed landscape architect. Um, so it's sort of in the way that I am uh, designing and in the art adjacent field, but not really a truly an artist, but that's also like me saying, you know, I suffer the worst of the imposter syndrome. So I would never probably claim myself as an art true artist, but um, but like, you know, like kind of practicing as a designer and in the architectural industry, it's it's very limiting. And I remember even back in like when I was choosing majors back in college, I wanted to do art. I, I want to get like get into fine art. But again, like part of like of my upbringing as a Asian immigrant and also like just growing up in general, you learn that, you know, art is not the easiest way to make money and to keep your stomach fat. So like, you know, part of me were like, okay, well, how can I still be sort of this creative person I always aspire to be but also make a living and then that's kind of like the second compromise I chose is kind of oh like I can design things um but then was as you get into the industry um it's like a lot more limiting to you kind of your creative side of uh your brain because you know a lot of stuff is very technical and also you're dealing with clients and they have also all those crazy demands they have to meet all the time and plus, you know, there's that office structure. I have to, like, the design I come up with, I have to go through multiple layers of reviews and filters. So it's really hard to kind of get your creative vision started and carry through on a project. Um, so mm -hmm. I have always a little bit frustrated with that process. Um, so looking forward, um, another kind of means for me to explore more freely um, of kind of designing and art in general. So that's when I started looking into like, what can I do outside of work that can also in, in a way inspire me back to what I do at my work and also what can my background in architecture and landscape architecture carry into another different media. Um, and seems to me like getting my hands dirty with dirt and also sculpting something out of nothing. It's like a very closely connected media for me from landscape architecture where I'm already kind of sculpting the earth into something mm -hmm. uh, to a little bit of micro scale of that. Um, so, um, but, so that's a my long way of saying that's how I sort of find this um, side hobby that for me to do is kind of the pottery uh, thing but I, I yeah I started going to Eastside Pot Shop 2019 of course as everyone starts we kind of started on the wheel trying to you know pull a cylinder uh, but <laughs> but now you know a few years later I sort of starting to explore my own languages in like what do what's truly me so I started doing a lot more hand building and for with forms that's a lot more organic were inspired by nature in a way so um as you're probably familiar since you bought one of my pomegranate but I um I I have been exploring a lot of fruits and other nature objects like like rocks and boulders and pebbles that you find in the riverbed uh, so a lot of kind of natural elements how, how can I 
uses kind of a man-made technique with clay and to artificially shape it into something that's more organic and natural uh because that's also like what i'm mostly familiar with with my work is a lot of time we're kind of using landscape design to heal a artificially interrupted land like you when you build a house it's interrupted the natural flow of the surrounding areas but how can we heal the land back into the architecture itself it's a lot of that similar language that's carried into pottery for me um but but again like i i think also for me it's a very consistent language that i'm trying to carry through my design work not only in architecture design and also in pottery because i remember the first time I ever did the pottery class at Eastside Pot Shop as a wheel throwing class. They asked me what I want to make. And I remember the first thing I said was, I want to make a tray uh, or a trinket dish has, that has like a pomegranate stem coming out of it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that is the first thing I ever made. So it's kind of, oddly enough, like the same language has been carrying with me this whole time. Uh, like I'm just naturally drawn to kind of those organic forms um and and it's been just a continuous journey for me to explore that and to see how can I tie that to my uh personal understanding of those elements I had the assumption that you did some kind of professional design work I didn't know really anything about you or what you did but I just um I can I can see it in what you are creating that you have um you know you have a design eye and that it comes through in in what you're creating um and i love what you said about like landscape design sort of being the macro and the pottery organic working with the clay being like a micro um you know, iteration of that same thing. Uh, it's it's really cool how how that has synced up for you. As far as the imposter syndrome goes, um, I remember when I came and and bought the uh, the pomegranate from you that you I had made a comment of like I think I had some money from my tax return and so I was like you know whenever I have some extra money I like to try to support artists and also build my my little tiny collection up and um you you were very humble and you just like oh, I don't consider myself an artist and um but I think that is I wanted to talk to you just because I was so drawn to to your work and what you've been doing, um, but also like that uh, that sentiment I think is so extremely common, and I mean I have it, like you know I still have to um, give myself a little talk about calling myself an artist and now I'm in this whole new realm of creating videos and whatnot and absolutely having some imposter syndrome there um but I feel like that um just generally speaking not not only in the arts but in everything that we we tend to forget the value of the beginner's mind and um and and just like what a a freeing place that is to kind of have everything still be new you know and fresh mm -hmm. and like what what that brings to um a community of people who again like maybe very mixed like people who have been working at this skill or trade or craft or whatever it is for decades and people who are brand new to it and then everything in between it's really like um you know this be beautiful kind of tapestry of like weaving that all together and ever like everyone has something to contribute um 
Cause you can absolutely get stuck in a rut, you know, when yeah. you've been doing something for a really long time. And sometimes it takes that person to walk in and have a different perspective or approach, or even if it's just like a total accident because you're figuring it out. And then, but all of a sudden you do something that's like, whoa, that was really cool. I wouldn't have thought to do that, you know, because it's not like according to the rules or um, the expected um, practices or whatever. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that um, because I feel like it's something that, that all creative people struggle with at various points, you know, and yeah. it's really important. And, and I like, thank you <laughs> for being the representative representative of that in this, uh, case, but, um, I mean, I absolutely consider you to be an artist. So even if you're oh, not, <laughs> even if you're not there, um, I think that what you're, you're creating is, um, it's just, it's just like really wonderful. And it's, it's not only, you know, like technically proficient already from, from where you started at 2019 to 2023, but, um, I just like, it's a very hard to describe sort of felt experience when looking at your work um and I know you know there's this whole thing about um ceramics and and functional art and how does that all fit into the fine arts and what I mean that's a whole other conversation but um I mean I I think that that's also based on kind of a limited western academic tradition right. um, that is changing you know rightfully so I think um mm -hmm. so I don't know do you have any thoughts on that I just sort of went on a big soapbox there but <laughs> oh that's how I talk to like I just yeah. go on different tangents and then <laughs> departure for a long, long time like my last sentiment I felt like I went over and over um like on this whole thing when you had a simple question for me but <laughs> but uh, yeah I was gonna say like when you talked about like kind of the ceramics being the craft or the fine art like or how does it fit in that spectrum I, I do think you know it's been you know I think this ceramic scene is a generally in America has been struggling on that like is it a craft is it an art is it fine art or like how can we define it but I think really the biggest point for me, um, kind of allude back to my uh, uh, architecture training too. It's like a lot of times you have to, it's not about like the ability to design or ability to understand art. It's about your point of view. Like same with ceramics, you can be a perfectly good thrower. You can be making beautifully designed mugs all day long. But if you don't have, your unique point of view that's carried through your body of work, then you're just uh, making mugs at the end of the day. You know, it's not art. Uh, I think that's kind of the important part of it. Like you need just need, I, I think it's the importance is finding that language that uh, that's unique to you and that, that perspective that's ex uh, exclusively yours. I, I think that's the more important part of it. And I think I'm still kind of researching that and finding that lane that's like, how can I convey my identity into the work I do uh, not only in kind of landscape architecture design but also like in my pottery uh, pieces as well um, like for instance those pomegranate shapes uh, I was drawn to them because they have a cultural significance in Chinese culture um, you know it's longevity and fertility um, uh, it's because you know how many seeds they have is and it's like symbolism of life and offsprings uh, so it's a lot of that kind of balancing our art of like how can I inject life into those pieces so that it, it showcases who I am and how I view the world I guess that's how 
I see the difference between crafts and art within the ceramic realm. I was actually going to ask you about the pomegranates specifically and if there was some sort of significant meaning for you. So I'm glad that you you said right. that. Um, yeah, and also I not I I find out this later, but uh, some friends bought a pomegranate from me because they uh, said also apparently uh, pomegranates have this uh, cultural significance in Judaism as well. Um, they failed to explain to me what they exactly it meant, uh, but it was like a pretty significant meaning in uh, uh, Jewish culture as well, though. <laughs> yeah, they have. It's interesting. I've done a little bit of research on on the symbolism of them, but um, they're, you know, they're kind of entrenched in a lot of cultures across the entire planet. Um, and the symbolism is like, a little bit different, but also it overlaps, which I find really interesting. Um, I mean, I I was drawn to it just uh, like I I read tarot cards, and in um, in the tarot, they're associated with a couple of cards that I like really have always been drawn to, and uh, one is the Empress, and one is the High Priestess, and they're um they are associated with like feminine or like yin qualities um and there's like this sort of organic creative birth energy to the to the that symbolism and definitely it's to do with like all of the the seeds the color and then just even like uh you you know you have it on some of the um the pieces that you've created whether it was intentional or not it's almost kind of like a, a vaginal shape you know right. it's exposing the seeds on the inside um and so you know that was like that was my particular personal uh attraction to those pieces and and then of course just they're really beautiful um, but yeah, the, the global, like, symbol, symbolic nature of pomegranates is really interesting to me because there's not, I don't feel like there's a lot of other fruits, <laughs> you know, that are that specific that, um, are kind of included everywhere, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting how I feel like, you know, a lot of culture symbolism are tied to uh, fruit and food mm -hmm. in general, right? It, it's it's kind of interesting. And I also think about pomegranates a lot because like on a kind of horticulture side of uh, kind of a point of view, like, you know, like there is a significant culture roots of pomegranates in Asian culture, but it's not indigenous plant to that part of the world. Like, you know, it is first introduced from India when that plant was migrated into uh, China much later but then somehow there's that symbolism that's embedded into the Chinese culture and some other Asian um, counterparts as well so it's kind of interesting how that all carries through uh, but yeah definitely kind of interesting uh, yeah um, and then you know, there's there's pomegranates there's persimmons you've got some pancakes yeah <laughs> uh, all, all the keywords um pears pears <laughs> yeah i was trying to remember what all they they are that you've that i've seen you do and then there's some where you're like combining like there's like a strawberry attached to to other fruits and and yeah. they also made me like I don't know if this is just like a mid-century kind of American thing or what, but like my grandparents always had on the center of the table, a bowl of fake fruit, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and I've seen the, I've seen different iterations of that. Like, um, you know, there's just like plain plastic ones. And then there's some that are kind of like beaded and more decorative. Um, but it has a real, 
also like comforting, cozy feel as well. Like the idea of like having this um, fruit that's, you know, it's not real fruit, it's decorative fruit just displayed in, in your home or in the kitchen or dining area or whatever, wherever it may be is has, just feels really cozy and I feel like it's definitely that association with my my the older generations of my family and you know I haven't seen fake plastic fruit in people's homes in a long time but um right. the ceramic the ceramic version is um you know it's definitely a a prettier <laughs> version of it I guess right yeah I think part of that was also my inspiration going into it um like uh yeah like you know like the mystery like especially I, I have a very strong memory of like those glass I think they're glass those grapes that oh yeah, are, yeah. like all those round gl glassy cute uh, you know round balls and they're just also so beautiful to look at yeah um uh but again like for me I think also like fruits are so embedded into my memory because it's not only like delicious but it's also like a very cultural thing like we always like whenever we have a celebration whenever it's a festival or you know we are providing offerings to the buddha or to like the our uh, family that have passed on then we always offer fruits you know like it's there's a very sentimental values to that so not only to fill your stomach but also it's it's like uh, a media to carry your thoughts and off, uh, uh, offerings to the higher above uh, so it, it seems to me like there's a lot of meanings and it just like you said it just it's cozy it brings good vibes in the house right yeah. but but then I wanted something that I'm already making an artificial interpretation of that natural fruit. I don't want it to look exactly like that. Like, you know, like the plastic fruits in the 50s. Uh, I don't want exactly like that. Uh, I want it to feel like it's either the form of that reminds you of a fruit, like the pomegranates. I try to make it pretty realistic to how a pomegranate would look or how it would feel in the hand. But it's never the colors of the pomegranates you're truly seeing. It's not like that vibrant burnt orange kind of color on the skin. Uh, it's always a little bit different color um, and some patterns on that sometimes too. Um, and then the seeds, uh, I typically make it a little bit different color too, just so that, you know, it's ob obvious when you look at it, it's inspired by a pomegranate, but it's not trying to be overly mimicking that uh, uh, to be a to look like a real pomegranate so it's obvious it's fake but <laughs> yeah yeah um I mean they're definitely very sculptural you know like breaking them down into these shapes and um and, and rearranging them sometimes, you know, it's like, there's one that I'm thinking of that's, it's like, it's quartered. Yeah. And then, you know, there are, the pieces are, are arranged to, you know, to be touching in the center. Um, and you would, you would not, yeah, it's not like realistic, like you would actually see that, but it's just sort of like you taking that form and breaking it down and rearranging it into something really, um, I mean, it's like that whole thing of seeing uh, seeing something that's like every day and that you, you, you might overlook. And when you present it in a different way, it makes you kind of take notice, you know, of something yeah. that otherwise would be taken for granted. Another big inspiration for me is um, Isamu Noguchi uh, in the uh, stone sculptor that he, it, it's interesting also he, you know, he's Japanese, but he's also American. So he had kind of that multitude of like different aspects from like growing up in the Western culture, but also have that J uh, Japanese uh, roots. But he goes back to Japan a lot to find a lot of his granite sculptures are made of stone uh local in japan um 
but sorry that was another tangent but I was gonna say uh with his work he was is exploring a lot of kind of man-made marks onto a very natural media um so like the forms he makes a lot of time is a very natural to the point you would think oh this form could if you look at it from far away it could easily be a rock that they find in the nature and just having the wind and the natural elements sculpted it naturally that way yeah. but but then he adds on his own marks like you know the chisel marks and also the drill marks that you find from natural coring process of the the rocks itself uh, so it's a lot of that kind of balancing act of like how can we I feel like in my perspective, it's like how can we humbly introduce those human interactive, um, my own point of view, in, inject into this natural element, making it kind of minimum, but also with minimum touches, how can we make it uniquely ours? I think it's that kind of, and also like a literal balancing act to like, you know, how can we stack pieces on top of each other that looks precarious, but also structurally stable as a sculpture. So it's a lot of that balancing. Yeah. Yeah. There was, um, was it a salt and pepper or like a creamer set or something that you made that was yeah. like when you're describing that, I was picturing the balancing of all those different. Pieces. Yeah. That one in particular was directly inspired by Isamu Naguchi. And if you think about it, it's very similar to that uh, coffee table that it's mostly famous for. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of like kind of that balancing act. It's like, you know, I basically extracted forms of boulders you would naturally find or rocks on the ground. And then how can we stack it in such a way that feels almost primal, but also delicate in, in the same way uh, but yeah it is a sugar and creamer uh, uh, it's actually born from a competition at Eastside Pot Shop so it kind of goes back to that as well a little bit like I love being in that environment because it always challenges you and also like you can get inspired by one their competitions they put together every every session and also um, just by other people's works too like just I love being in that environment where you can get influenced and get inspired by other people's works as well. I think that's been a tremendous uh, tool for me to develop my own uh, kind of design language into ceramics. Yeah, yeah. That's something that they started after I was there. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't, I haven't ever gotten to participate in any of those, but um, I've definitely enjoyed, you know, seeing the, the images that they share of all everything that comes out of those um right. some, like again it's just like really really high quality cool stuff that people are making it's impressive and i i mean i know because i've i've benefited benefited from their teaching but i think both of them are just amazing teachers Yeah, it's just guys making me miss it so much. Like I've really wanted to get back into doing pottery and stuff. I feel like I just barely scratched the surface, but there's something about, um, I don't know. I mean, everything I'm, I'm a mainly 2d artist and it's a different way of, of thinking, uh, working with working in three dimensions. And um, I, I feel like it's important to, you know, that's something I try to do is, um, is continually like challenge myself to try something new just because it kind of keeps things fresh. And even if it's something that I don't necessarily stick with, um, mm -hmm. you know, like I, in the talk with Renee, that I did, I was talking about taking this astrophotography workshop that, right. you know, ultimately, like I enjoyed it, but it's, it was, um, it's probably not something that I'm going to continue with, except for maybe every now and then it just like, wasn't my thing, but, mm -hmm. um, but the pottery, like the, the hands-on building, um, there's just something about that that's really like I feel like triggers like the like the child mind 
and just like that pure imaginative state and like getting your hands and into the materials and messy and dirty, you know, um, what is that like for you when you're working with, with clay? And I mean, I know a lot of people say that it has a very meditative, calming quality. Um, what's your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. I think it does calm my mind a lot. Uh, and to be honest, I think one of the reasons I'm still doing it uh, is because of that. My work, I would say, it's pretty stressful most of the time. Uh, you know, having to meet deadlines and dealing with because with construction, you never can predict everything that's gonna happen on the job site. It's always like you know, fire drills left and right. So like I'm very stressed all the time so having a media where I can be like just be in my zone being with the clay that I'm trying to sculpt with and just not having to worry about everything else that's yeah. been a great help for me mentally um, and also I oddly enough I love how clay feels on my hands so I, I think it's also kind of a physical thing like I just love being able to touch clay even yeah. though I don't know if it's great for my skin because it draws moisture out, but <laughs> but it's it's really a comforting exercise for me. Yeah. Have you gotten into um I mean some of your glazing is just absolutely gorgeous and the the soda kiln was that was new after I was there. So I never got to work with any of that. But um I mean that's a whole other side of it is like understanding glazes and how they work and the chemistry of it all and um you know my experience of it was that um Scott and Rebecca and the other people teaching there that they were they were developing the recipes or using existing recipes and kind of preparing that for everyone but have you gotten into that side of it at all uh, I have been like tipping my toe into that a little bit. That's pretty recent development. But um, for me, uh, yeah, like for one, I started doing a wood firing class with uh, IELTS Doc Center, uh, um, and so we are gearing up towards my first uh wood firing in um October. So I'm really looking forward to that. Nice. Um. But yeah, it's kind of funny how like you know basically wood firing is kind of the what kind of started it all right like all the salt firing and soda firing was initially invented in America to kind of mimic the effect of wood firing um so I'm kind of like trying going back to the roots of that that started it all again like it's not exactly the same type of firing technique that you see in Asia but um it's it's still pretty uh close to that kind of primal almost uh, firing techniques with the wood, uh, wood firing um but but yeah like you said I really appreciate having that soda fire uh cap cap capability at Eastside Pot Shop but that, that largely influenced me a lot with kind of a lot of the pomegranates you see are uh soda fired uh just to get that kind of natural um almost unpredictable uh glazing on them mm -hmm. uh and I think to me, uh, in general, I my design style is pretty uh, organic, um, and even with my work back in uh, architecture design too, I remember uh, vividly one of my first uh, design project back in college was like, oh, you basically choose three uh, descriptors and then use those three words to design a, a a space that emotes that feeling. Uh, I remember the first, uh, that's the first design challenge basically we have to do. And then for that assignment, my words were very, um, I, I believe they were, uh, the, the words are very restricting. They were like almost like symmetry, uh, straight lines. It's like everyone looking at those words would be like, oh, I'm going to design something that's very symmetrical, very uh, geometrical. But then I, I remember I turned in something that's very curvilinear and definitely asymmetrical. <laughs> and then everyone was like, okay, well, I guess that speaks strongly about how you, you are as a person. Uh, you're not uh, 
yeah I just naturally I'm not attracted to like perfectness I I, I know the word is a little bit overused now but I'm definitely into wabi-sabi you know how yeah. that's like a little bit imperfect and very uh, natural dynamic glazes that's how I would approach things that's why uh, in the Isai Pasha that you know we do have some American uh, uh, Shino glazes that's inspired by the traditional Japanese Shinos uh, <clears throat> like I like you to layer a lot of those so that even though those glazes are pre-developed you know in the studio that I didn't have hands on I can kind of mix them up a little bit uh, and and also adding another decorative layers of either slip or other sort of um, under under glazes or uh, uh, cobalt or any other oxide washes to give it a little bit more surface iterations throughout the piece. Um, and lately, I've been also trying to add like mason stains into existing glaze to tint it a different color. Uh, so I've been exploring a lot of that, but I think for me, like glazing to me is all about like how can I take something that it's already provided to me at the East Side Pasha, but make it uniquely mine. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, I feel like you're achieving that. Do you feel? <laughs> are you feeling? How are you feeling about what you're creating? Um. Are you? Still I, feeling some satisfaction and it's it's kind of goes back to that imposter syndrome so i i feel like it's been kind of a roller coaster of emotions some good days when i feel good about the piece i feel very energized i feel like yeah. oh sky's my limit i can do whatever i want and then yeah. uh, really sometimes you think about oh can i just be a full-time potter now and like even you know quit my day job but then there's also days I feel like, oh, the pieces I'm making are absolute garbage. Like, why am I making this stuff? Like, it's yeah. not even good. Uh, so it's kind of been like a lot of that back and forth. But I, I think I am still definitely pretty at, at the beginner stage still. I, I think I'm still exploring like the media and understanding like what can I and finding that voice for that's uniquely me. I think that's still something I'm trying to uh, explore a little bit further like I, I've been making those pomegranates but I'm also like to the point right now I'm at minus five pomegranates right now I have some commission pieces to need to, need to make but I feel like that's also holding me down a little bit like I love those pomegranates and they're beautiful but I also don't want to be the person known to just make pomegranates you're you the know, pomegranate so. guy <laughs> Right. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. But also like, I don't want to be just that. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I've been trying to uh, branch out like lately, I've been trying to explore different ways to uh, coil build that alters the surface. I've been making a lot more vases now. I think that's kind of a natural form that would blend well because that it's, it's kind of a sculptural form, but also give me the opportunity to incorporate floral uh, elements afterwards too like that's yeah. been something I'm really excited about like making a vase and then buying flowers that's uh that's complementary to that piece and then putting flower arrangements together because yeah. for that and it's which been is like something... a whole other art form in itself you know yeah 100 percent yeah and and again it's just like one more sort of iteration of you uh working with these natural organic materials you know yeah. either in in sculpting them in clay or designing them in the landscape and then with actual living organic materials like flowers um it's just it all kind of comes together nicely yeah i, I think yeah. it's also because I'm, I'm not professionally trained i don't have a you know a bfa or mfa so like for me like it's kind of like I'm pretty unserious about this whole thing. I'm kind of like, okay, I'm I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to discover new things. Like the flowers, for, for floral arrangements thing, that's been pretty recent. Like big, mostly because even though I'm like, I'm a professional landscape architect, I don't have to deal with like cut flowers all that much, you know? Like, yeah. so it's kind of a new uh, category for me. But like, for instance, I'm going to Japan in November uh, for like a two week trip uh I, it's kind of funny but the first day I'm gonna be in Tokyo I, I signed up for a, a ikibana class yeah. 
as a the, the Tsugetsu um style ikebana, they have a headquarter in Tokyo, but it's kind of funny. It tied to the Isamu Naguchi story again because that headquarter is designed by Isamu Naguchi, and the, in the first floor it has a whole lot of kind of stone sculpture installations that he put together initially for the lobby. Uh, so that's how I first knew this place, but I, I knew I really always wanted to check it out. Uh, but then I recently, as of last year, got into Ikebana and then flower arrangements. So that kind of triggered me into like, oh, I wonder if they have classes. So I looked into it a little bit more. Originally, I was going to just go there to see the sculptures, but now I signed up for their Ikebana class. So it's kind of mm -hmm. interesting how that my ex exploration in pottery and art in general has been like branching out into other fields and giving me opportunity to be uh, exposed into all those aspects of things that I would have never um, had the experience with. Yeah, before, so. that's lovely. It's like it's creating a foundation for you know just building and layering on all of that stuff. I look forward to seeing what you come up with after that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm know. excited. So some of what you were just talking about, and then when you were talking about the the glazing and just the the you know the various ways that like these techniques have um either remained the same or been altered you know across the the planet across cultures across time was really like i don't know if i've ever really thought about before the fact that pottery is such an ancient human tradition you know it's like there's a whole era in human yeah. evolution you know that's defined by the fact that um that we developed the ability to create pottery and make those kinds of tools and it's something that that unites all human beings and the fact that um we're still working with either the same traditions or slightly altered traditions, similar materials. Um, it's There's something really beautiful in that that's just now hitting me, you know, that like just ties us, ties us all together, ties us to like all of our human ancestry, ties together like every culture in the world and then ties us also to to nature you know and to the earth and to the the soil mm -hmm. um it's a really like I'm, I'm kind of touched by that all of a sudden <laughs> it's it's lovely um i don't know do you have any thoughts on that uh yeah no i think uh I again like I'm terrible with like terminology so I um uh, I'm gonna try my best to remember but uh like you said like you know the pottery really as a trade goes back centuries it's really at the beginning of the Roman civilization it's been uh, and also like it, I think not only it's a huge inspiration of mine because I always love looking at old potteries from like different um culture and different time periods because that's always uh without being appropriation i always love to draw inspiration from those you know different cultures and see like oh there are there forms that i love that i can translate into a modern piece of pottery um and also like that i i, I also like I, of course i'm not a historian i don't really know a whole lot about this but like from my understanding or uh, like, you know, the Japanese culture, they used to have the indigenous people living on the islands before more mainland Asian influence kind of migrated in there through Korea and got in, onto uh, the, 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 the islands of Japan. And uh, they used to have pottery that's completely different than the pottery that's in vain of the uh, pot, the traditional Japanese pottery we see now, but it's, uh, they used to look almost kind of tribal and primal. Uh, and then all of a sudden, like not even that long later, like a hundred years later, they all changed to that kind of more traditional uh, Asian forms that you see nowadays. It's because, you know, that big group of uh, 
indigenous people migrated through Asia, through Korea into Japan and basically erased the previous culture. So that's what, you know, that, you know, and then the proof is in the pottery pieces. So it's kind yeah. of interesting how those were the physical evidence of like how those cultures ex existed and transformed. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of love that aspect of it. Um, and also like in Chinese pottery, there's, you know, there's, there used to be the five famous ancient kilns that fires each uniquely different glazes with kind of Chang glaze or Saladon glazes. And also you have Jing De Jin, where, you know, most of the imperial wares were born for centuries. That's where essentially why China is named China, because Jing De Jin was called China because uh, they were making China. So, <laughs> so, so it's kind of interesting. But again, like, it's also like fascinating how techniques has been transforming and changing over time too like uh part of the reason why Jing Jin is the clay capital or the porcelain capital of the world was because they mined their own porcelain there but now from what I read is they are running out of their porcelain because uh, you know they've been digging that clay for years and now it's finally at the point where it's mostly gone so what does that make that city you know like the that the the material was what what caused that city to bloom as the clay capital but now the material is gone but the techniques all stayed so it's kind of interesting how that all is transforming as age goes down so it's kind of interesting yeah absolutely and you're incredibly knowledgeable and informed about it, it seems like um much more than i am so i appreciate that well, I, I think that's also part of the danger of it. Like, I, I think I, I, I love to dabble on stuff. Like, so I would read a little bit about this, read a little bit about that, but I never read into details. That's why I can't give you the exact names of those tribal cultures I was talking about. Because yeah. <laughs> I just know enough to be dangerous, but not enough yeah. to be really informative. So. <laughs> right. I know that feeling. But from, from, uh, from my perspective, it was very informative. So... <laughs> <laughs> It was a lot more than I knew, so I appreciate that. Do you have any feeling of like where, how you'd like this to evolve uh, for you? Uh, I I think that's still part of my journey. I need to figure it out. Uh, I think uh, as of right now, I do want to get into uh, a little bit of, uh, bigger pieces that may have uh, a little bit more defined character that's uniquely me I think I'm still struggling with that like yeah I make pomegranates but everyone can make a pomegranate you know it's already there um, so like I'm trying to find forms and languages that uh, that can really speaks about my culture and my point of view I think that's still something I'm struggling with um, and also like how to make it make money <laughs> too yeah. so it's, you know uh because uh, a biggest struggle i have is i i don't like doing markets i also don't think you know the stuff i make is not really suited for a market like people mostly go to markets to buy mugs and would not to say anything bad with mugs but i, I don't make a lot of mugs and i don't think people are always in the market buying pomegranates or yeah. other ceramic fruits um and also I'm like terrible with like goes back to imposter syndrome I feel terrible asking to come up a price to you know to sell pieces and and then afterwards I always feel like oh am I charging too much or am I charging too little because you know mm -hmm. I'm spending those hours on like like should I charge it more but then you're charging too little <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but uh, it seemed to be the case everyone's telling me that but I also felt like like am I being greedy by charging this much you know it's it's yeah been, uh, it's that's hard. like the that's the ultimate question that any artist face faces you know um because it like it's time consuming to produce work and the materials are are not cheap you know, so there's the element of just kind of like, you've got to get back your, you know, your time and whatever you invested into it. Um, but also there's like, there's a the value aspect of it. Like, what is the value that you're giving to 
um, to someone uh, by them, you know, taking the work that you've you created and either using it in a functional uh, capacity or a decorative capacity or whatever it is, you know, I mean, I definitely like, I have a mug that is like my mug that I paid $50 for that some people would just be like, I can't believe you just paid $50 for a mug, but it's like, I didn't buy eight of them. I don't have a full set. I have one, it's mine. And there's like, there's an energy to drinking out of that hand created object that just like having starting my day slowly drinking from that mug as opposed to like a, a mass produced generic coffee mug like it it affects like my entire day and how and like how that's going to go and it's a real like subtle thing that is really hard to to articulate to people um but it's very real and it's very powerful. And I think that um, like people who are into collecting ceramics and pottery understand that. Um, but I, 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 I don't know. I feel, I just, there's, you know, you as a designer, I know you understand like that the spaces that we inhabit have an effect on on us and the same thing is true of the objects that we surround ourselves with and yeah. you know something that has been created by hand with heart and thought and consciousness um like really changes changes how you know like the whole energy of you of how you move through your day when it's um you know and it's going to be different for everyone like some people are going to be attracted to things that are very calming and soothing and beautiful and some people are going to want something that's a little more edgy and energizing or whatever it is you know um like humor um there's all kinds of elements in there and like <laughs> your pancakes that you made <laughs> I, I love those pancakes so much like I I um because it's a lidded it, it's a lidded vessel right so yeah yeah it's just like you know I I like having objects around me that do have a little bit of a sense of humor you know and they're like they're beautiful and attractive and appealing but also a little bit silly and fun and um because I you know I, I feel like we all could use a little bit of that in our lives yeah. so um I agree I just like I'm getting up on I'm going on that soapbox just as a um a way to to advocate for artists charging what we feel you know our work is worth and and rather than like decide for someone else what they can afford you know decide like what's what's our bottom line like you know we can't go into the red in terms of the time and, and, and financial investment that we made okay. but also like recognizing the value that we bring to people's lives through what we've created is is um you know and 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 that's definitely wrapped up in that whole imposter syndrome thing. Yeah. But, um, but it's very real and it's very, it's tangible, you know, especially mm -hmm. when you're talking about pottery and something that you might be holding or touching and right. um, hard to measure, but very, very real and palpable. So that's my two cents. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah I agree like I remember now like I, I read somewhere uh of someone's post it, it's uh, they're not a, a ceramic artist but they were like a painter and they were talking about why the you know one of their piece recently sold for like two thousand dollars but which is not a whole lot 
uh, considering, you know, 50% of that goes to commission, and then you basically get $1,000, but, you know, after cutting back, you, know, have, you have to pay for the rent that you're covering for the studio and all the material cost and all the hours you put into it. They're basically getting paid below minimum wage for the hours that they put into it, which is, yeah. you know, kind of the reality we have to face as artists sometimes, you know, it's just, it seems like a lot of, it seems like, okay, the piece is a little expensive, but yeah, it's, you're comparing to like, say a mass produced mug sold at Walmart or Target, right. you know, like it's just not the same. Uh, and the time investment is there. And then the hours of hours that you spend that produce failed pieces and also pieces that you decide not to sell because they were not up to your standard. Those are all yeah. time investments you can't make profit out of, right? Yeah. So see, yeah, it's 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 been a struggle for me uh, in landscape architecture as well. Like, cause a lot of time people think landscape architects, they think gardeners, which I love gardeners, but, you know, we are a little bit different. Like, you know, we have to go through a five-year professional degree training to, and also hours and hours of practice before we can even get licensed. Um, and then a lot of people still think, oh, why are we paying you so much money for the service? I, I can just go to Home Depot and buy a tree, which is not how it works. Yeah. Uh, but so it's been kind of like double struggle for me on both ends it's like yeah. how to convince people that your service and your expertise are valued and but it's always hard to market yourself I think it is yeah but I see people doing it you know um there are people who are making a living creating yeah. pottery and artwork and it's 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 doable um I mean Part of part of this for me is um, is advocacy for the arts, mm -hmm. and you know this is these videos are a total experiment, and I have no idea like who's going to end up watching them and what the reach is going to end up being eventually. Like it's it's got it's got a ways to go to build up, but um, but I do feel like that. Um, you know, having having a personal connection to an artist and to what they're they're creating helps people um, first of all understand like what what goes into it and um, and develop like a connection and an appreciation that um, you know the arts just there's not a they're not valued in our in our world in general and um there's a lot of reasons for that but i do think i do think part of it is that it has been um held as this sort of elitist uh category or like frivolous thing and it can be both of those things, but it also is so, so, so much more. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not something that generally is taught in schools anymore, especially <laughs> less right. and less so, unfortunately. So I feel like, I mean, just my, my personal experience is that people get intimidated um, by it because they don't feel like that they know how to talk about it or they're going to come off in a way that, you know, makes them feel, um, and I'm not sure exactly what the right word is, but, um, you know, like uncultured or something, uh, but it's really, I think it's really just a symptom of our larger culture and the fact that that it's been kept so separate, you know, and I really, and there's a lot of artists who don't like to talk about their work and want people to just um, approach it, you know, in whatever way that they're going to, but I, I like talking and words are also like one of my my art forms and so um and I also come from an education family 
and I spent 25 years working in educational publishing. And so that part of me that, uh, that has like a desire to, to connect and, and out, you know, it's like an, a form of outreach is, is in all of this. So I really absolutely appreciate you like, um, being, being a part of this and bringing up like those particular topics, because I think it's really, really important. Um, I mean, that's why I'm living with my parents right now, because it's just, it's, I, I made the choice to focus on this. And I, I was in a position that my professional work was not, uh, it was not supporting me anyways, as a single parent in Austin, but um, it was interfering with my ability to to do like creative work because it was so just time consuming and stressful and the scheduling was so crazy um so you know it's come with a lot of sacrifice and i i don't think people fully understand like what goes into creating this stuff and and why artists are charging what they're charging you know right so um so we've been talking for about an hour. Is there anything wow. else that you want to um, share with people or share about your work or that we haven't covered? Uh, no, I think we were pretty um, expansive with our topics. We covered a wide range of topics, but I, I did have to say I'm really appreciative of this experience. I, I think you, I feel like you were very descriptive and also very um smart with your words versus me I'm not always the best with words and also um I think that goes to my work too like sometimes I because of that I think I'm kind of like more on the visceral side like I'm kind of more inwards and all my pieces are like oh what can I do to emote feelings and to encourage a conversation and I feel like I learned a lot from your interpretation interpretation of my work during this conversation today. Um, but I, I think that's why I love talking about my piece with other people is just I'm learning more about my pieces as I talk with other people about them. Uh, so I, I really appreciated that. Um, and but yeah, so thank you. Ah, thank you. This was lovely. And, um, and also just like a pleasure to get to know you a little better. So, um, I really, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, it really, really was such a pleasure. I know I said that, but it, like, it just was such a pleasure. Um, and like I have felt with all of the artists that I've talked to you so far, I really hope that it's a beginning point and that there will be more to come. Uh, for myself and for all of you. So if you haven't followed Alan on Instagram already, please do that. And um, I'm still working on scheduling my next artist. So I'm not going to say in particular who they are, but there's some really cool people um, I'm in conversation with right now. And please stay tuned for that. Um, in the meantime, here's a little tiny bonus uh, conversation that we had um, after we kind of said our goodbyes and we kept talking a little bit. So uh, if you're interested in the Texas art scene, this, this might be of interest to you if you're interested in grassroots versus traditional funding of the arts and programming and all that kind of thing also might be of interest. So um, hope you enjoy. Thanks again for tuning in. Because I I do love San Antonio, especially with all the museums they have. Yeah. Um, that's one thing I think is a little bit lacking with Austin too. We don't have like people, rich people to advocate for art. In yeah. Cities. It's a weird, it's like a of the cities in Texas, it's kind of, it's different in that way. Yeah. And it was something that was like really apparent to me when I, I used to live in Denton for a long time and I worked in Dallas and Fort Worth and then um, moved to 
to Austin in 2004. And it was definitely something that I noticed. And at, at that time, the art scene in Austin was nothing like what it is now. I mean, there wasn't very much going on. It was very quiet. And it's it's been um, like, it's all been grassroots development from the artist level, which mm -hmm. I find really, really interesting as opposed to like what you just said, like that there's existing money that has a tradition of supporting the arts, you know, and through museums and foundations and, and whatever. So it has a real different feel to it uh, that has pros and cons, I guess, right. you know? Yeah. Um, okay, well, again, thanks so much. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. I look for, I definitely look forward to seeing what you come up with after your, your trip to Japan. Yeah, me too. I'm excited for it. <laughs> yeah.